time for overtime. Stop what you're doing and listen. In the world of sports, it's all about the playmakers in today's headlines. From locals to the pros. With interviews from local standouts and sports all-stars across the country that will have you talking. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here with the national champions. Hear from coaches to players, sports analysts, and broadcasters who are a part of the action every day. Overtime, now with Burt Ramin on ESPN 102.3 AM 1000 KSOO. Sioux Falls Sports Leader. Welcome into an early Wednesday of overtime. 10 o'clock to start today off the air at 11.30, making ways for the Minnesota Twins pregame coverage out in Baltimore. Minnesota up against it right now, needs to start winning some games. More on those Twins here soon. 6-10 and ten their record, and they're chasing a couple white-hot teams right now within the AL Central. There's certainly a lot to get to today, a lot to love on this Wednesday edition of overtime, including... Everything you need to know if you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan in preparation for next week's NFL draft. Where do the Chiefs pick? Who could they take? Who should they take? Adam Teicher, ESPN NFL Nation, Kansas City Chiefs reporter, joins us in about 20 minutes on today's program. We also will round out our number one doing something a little different. We've got a prolonged edition of the good, the bad, the ugly. Why prolong? Because there's a lot of news, and there's one particular topic that I have categorized in the very ugly category that I wanted to wax poetic on, talk a little bit more on, and something that is very, very bad in the sports world right now, in particular college football and the transition from college football to the NFL. We'll dive into that and much, much more at the end of our number one. It is a prolonged edition of The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. An article struck a nerve with me today from ESPN. I wanted to tell you all about it, talk about what we can do differently moving forward, and also the challenges of some of our best college football players players out there in our country. We'll dive into that later on in our number one. Our number two is only a half hour today. We're off the air at 1130, but we will fill you in and give you an opportunity to win with today's identity crisis. Always brought to you by the original Pancake House. Always on a Wednesday. It pays to tune in early for the show log and for your courtesy clue. Today's courtesy clue for the identity crisis. You can win big, a gift card to OPH, and I've got some LFA MMA tickets to give away. I'll give a four-pack away today for the person that can identify this former Major League Baseball player. That's your courtesy clue off the jump today for today's identity crisis. That's coming up around 11.15, and at that time, we're also going to dive into the latest from the National Football League, including a marquee quarterback back on the practice field, and your pair of NFL draft previews for the day. Been funny. A couple teams in succession in the NFL draft have uh, duked it out in recent Super Bowls. We previewed the Bengals and the Rams recently. Today, we'll preview the Colts and the New Orleans Saints. Not all too long ago, did they match up in the big game as well? That's the show log and lineup today. And now on to your scorecard, the NHL. Most teams have wrapped up the regular season. Still a few games to go. Last night certainly brought the entertainment. Las Vegas wins at home over Chicago 3-1. Final record on the season with or with one game to go for Chicago 23-53 and 5. Vegas is 45-28 and 8. But the real stories were elsewhere. It was in the Eastern Conference. Detroit and Montreal duking it out. And Detroit finds a way to win when they needed it. Here he comes, trying to get the only goal to shoot out. Skates in wide, cuts to the front of the goal, slows it down, shoots and scores. He made it look too easy. Red Wings win in the shootout. Patrick Kane with the lone goal. The Red Wings season comes to a close after winning this hockey game 5-4. 5-4 the final there. So Detroit, 5-4 winners in shootout fashion. But they're not going to the playoffs because Washington found a way to win their game. It was an empty net win over Philly as they cleared the net with three minutes to go. Ended up paying for it, but they had to do it as Washington and TJ Oshie slammed the door and punched their way through to the postseason. Malenstein and Oshie ready alongside, and it's one cleanly. Back to Carlson. He feeds it out to center. Start spreading the news. The Capitals are going to the postseason. They are going to the 2024 Stanley Cup playoffs. Good morning. 
morning, good afternoon, and good night, Philadelphia. The Capitals take on the Rangers in game one this weekend at Madison Square Garden. Fired up on the call for D.C. Capitals on their way to the postseason. 2-1 winners. Empty net goal late, 40-31 and 11. The record, Washington gets by not only Philly, not only Detroit, but others to clinch that final wild card spot in the Eastern Conference. Washington going dancing, as is Winnipeg with a 4-3 win over Seattle. The Jets were already in the postseason, 51-24 and 6. Vancouver also got another win last night, 50-22 and 9. Their record playoff field in both conferences is officially set. Some seating measures could still change just a bit, but that should all be finalized in the next day or so. NBA Finals from last night, one that some people may have seen coming. The Lakers take care of business to the tune of a 110-106 road win down in New Orleans, and the Lakers draw a matchup with Denver in the first round. Here is LeBron with the ball on the left side. Game tied at 97-5 to shoot. Shoots over Herb Jones and hits it. Huge shot by LeBron, and Jones was playing perfect defense. Big win there for L.A. LeBron James, fantastic. 23 points, 9 rebounds, 9 assists. Big performance from Zion Williamson last night in a loss. 40 points and 11 rebounds. New Orleans falls, which means they get the winner of Golden State and Sacramento. And this one last night, to put it simply, wasn't all that close as it may have signaled the end of the run for Golden State. They swing it to Keegan, going for another one. He hits it from the line drive on the right wing. That's the eighth three-pointer that Keegan Murray has made in 13 attempts. He has 32 points. Murray would finish with a game-high 32 points, nine rebounds. Sacramento with the win will now face off with New Orleans on Friday in the eight-seed game. But first things first, let's talk about that Warriors dynasty that has come crashing down pretty darn ugly. Klay Thompson on the way towards free agency, perhaps. Steph Curry says, we're not going to win every year. I understand this league changes and there's so many things that go into it and we're not going to play forever. But, you know, we've uh, experienced so much together and... At the end of the day, like, again, I know they want to win. I know I want to win. And that's all I worry. That's all I'm, uh, that's all I'm worried about. Really tough stuff last night for Golden State. Final score, Sacramento, an emerging team, 118-94 to over Golden State. Warrior season comes to a close just shy of another postseason appearance. Been tough sledding lately, but this year across the board just feels a little different from a Warriors perspective, not only with the continuance uh, of appearances of bad looks from Draymond Green. You also got a little bit of uh, attitude along the way from Klay Thompson. Now he's an impending free agent. Steph Curry clearly a little frustrated and ejected following last night's loss it feels like the end of an era in golden state we'll debate that later in the show but certainly a changing of the times changing of the guard maybe clay thompson's out maybe other players come in and they need to get other players involved frankly get some youth injected in the roster and move forward steph curry absolutely fantastic still draymond with some gas in the tank same deal with clay but do they all fit together anymore that's the debate this offseason for steve kerr and that team out in the bay area now now tonight, Eastern Conference play-in games. Heat and Sixers, 6 o'clock on ESPN. Winner of that one gets the second-seeded Knicks in the Eastern Conference playoffs. Tenth-ranked Hawks uh, against the ninth-seeded Bulls in Chicago. 8.30 on ESPN tonight. Loser of that one eliminated from playoff contention. Now we'll hear from Tim Legler talking a little bit more about those Golden State Warriors. He thinks it's unlikely that we see Steph Curry hoist a trophy again in his career. The bottom line is, though, I don't see, unfortunately, Steph Curry being on a team that's going to make a deep Western Conference run again because of what's out there, and all of those teams are going to get better. It's it's inconceivable to him to think about proceeding forward without Steph, without Clay Thompson and Draymond Green next to him, right? It's inconceivable to think about. Well, and if that's part of like what it's about for you, not just what we're able to do, but who I'm doing it with, and that's important to him as well then there may be some part of Steph Curry's mind that kind of understands. like We're not going to contend again. Because how else do you do it unless you jettison off some of these veteran parts? 
Tim Legler there of ESPN talking about Steph Curry, the future there, both uh, personally and with that particular franchise. Eight seed matchups on Friday. Eastern Conference, of course, to be determined, 6 o'clock on ESPN. Western Conference, Kings at Pelicans, 8.30 Friday night on TNT for the final playoff spot in the West. Playoffs officially start on Saturday. Here's the lineup as the times were released yesterday. Magic at Cavs leads us off Saturday at noon on ESPN. Timberwolves fans don't have to stay up late. 2.30 the start time for Game 1 from the Twin Cities, playing host to Phoenix. To be determined at the New York Knicks, 5 o'clock on ESPN on Saturday. Lakers at Nuggets, 7.30 the nightcap on ABC. Here's LeBron James on the opportunity and the challenge against going up against the defending champs. This is the defending champion. Uh, they know what it takes. They know how to win. They've been um, extremely dominant in their home floor over the last few years. Um, you know, they got an uh, MVP on their team. They got a closer on their team. Um, they got high-level players, high IQ players. They got a hell of a coach. So, um, you know, we have to play mistake-free basketball and make it tough on them. Um, they don't try to make it tough on us, obviously. Um, but it's going to, if we can play our, it's, it's the greatest game we can play. They're going to play as great as game they play. LeBron James there talking about the matchup with the Denver Nuggets. That series starts Saturday night, 7.30 on ABC. Not a whole lot of believers in the Lakers against Denver. Denver been one of, if not the best team in the league in the Western Conference throughout the season. But Evan Cohen this morning on Unsportsmanlike says the Lakers can beat Denver. I may be nuts. I think the Lakers got a shot against Denver. I'm not saying I'm picking them. I don't know. Like, the Lakers have a good roster. I look at it, and I say that if you look at the matchup against the Lake, uh, against the Nuggets, Anthony Davis, when healthy, is one of the best defenders in the NBA. That's not a great matchup. I understand that, <laughs> but no. let's see what he can do. Rui Hachimura and LeBron James are bigger physical wings that can match up with the Nuggets' bigger physical wings. And now D'Lo and Reeves can't match up with Jamal Murray? No. But Gabe Vincent has some experience matching up with Jamal Murray in the finals last year. It's not impossible to think that the Lakers give the Nuggets a run for their money. Lakers might win one game in that series, calling it now. I think Denver is a great team. I think the Lakers, to Cohen's point, have some good players. They have some great players. Obviously, I view LeBron James and Anthony Davis as great players when you're talking about the individual matchups, just about every matchup on the floor favors the Nuggets in that one. Give me the Nuggets in five in round one. Elsewhere, coming up on Sunday, to be determined against the Celtics, leads us off 12 o'clock on ABC. You got Mavericks and Clippers, 2.30. Pacers at Bucks, 6 o'clock. And another to be determined matchup in OKC for game one there, 8.30 on TNT. Major League Baseball finals from yesterday. Another tough one for the Minnesota Twins. They go down in Baltimore, 11. Seven to three. The 2-2 two -two pitch. And he'll swing and power this one a long way. Right center field. Buxton back at the wall. Leaping up. Gone. Out of his grasp. Buxton made a bid for it. And Ryan O'Hearn goes deep yet again. 11-3 the final there. Minnesota with the loss now 6-10. Other finals, Texas lost in Detroit yesterday 4-2. Tigers are 10-7. Identical record for the Chicago Cubs, who just yesterday were celebrating a big win in extras. And last night, the opposite, not in extras, but a big loss. Arizona comes through in the clutch. Now the 1-0 is swung on. That's it towards the gap. Diamondbacks are going to win it. Walker can walk home on the game-winning double. And Randall Gritchick, your hero tonight, has the Diamondbacks walking off 12 to 11. 12 11, the final. Cubbies are 10 and 7. Other finals, Colorado falls to 4 and 14 with a 5 0 shutout loss in Philly. Cleveland wins in extras against the Red Sox 10 to 7 in Boston. Guardians are 12 and 5. San Diego wins in Milwaukee 6 3. And St. Louis, with a road win over Oakland, improves their record to 9 and 9. That final score, 3. To two. Today and tonight in Major League Baseball, we're off the air early at 11.30 to make way for Twins pregame coverage from Baltimore. 11.30 pregame, 12.05 the projected start time. Other matchups today, Padres at Brewers, 12.10. Rangers at Tigers, same time. Royals and White Sox will play two from the south side, 1.10 and 4.10. Other matchups today, Cardinals at A's, Cubs at D-backs, Rockies at Phillies, Guardians at Red Sox. Brings us home with a 6-10 start time. NFL draft just over a week away, April 25th through the 27th. Next Thursday through Saturday from Detroit. One team that a lot of fans have their eyes on consistently, constantly. And they've been disappointed lately. The Dallas Cowboys, Lewis Riddick says, Cowboys have gotten much worse this offseason. 
The fact is your team has presently constructed, let's just say at the end of last year, wasn't good enough. Okay, and you're saying we're, when, when you say all in, you know that everyone else means you're doing whatever it takes to get over the hump. Not to just get there, but to get over it. They're worse this year than they were last year. Agreed. They're worse. They have one true starter on the offensive line, and they don't have really a running game. There is no – look, quite honestly, I think as they sit right now, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. They're not going to win the division. They ain't even going to come close to winning the division. Lewis Riddick of ESPN there. Pretty darn harsh on those Cowboys. I'll say this. You can be worse than you were last year, and, and as a 12-5 and five football team the last three years, you're still going to be in the postseason. I still think Dallas is good enough to win the division because Philly is worse as well. Absolutely worse is Philly. They're not only aging, they've got some issues. Kelsey retired and very underrated player on that offensive line. Hall of Famer. You miss a lot of people on the Eagles as well. Both Dallas and Philly probably are worse right now than they were last year. Does that mean they're not contenders? Absolutely not. I still view both of those teams as top five teams, maybe even top four teams in the NFC today. We'll wait and see after the draft, but Dallas obviously has a lot of needs. They need a running back or two. They need some offensive linemen. They need some youth. They need some help on defense and they need to play their best in the biggest moment, something that they haven't done since the mid-90s. NASCAR race Sunday, Talladega, 2 o'clock on Fox. PGA Tour Golf coming up this weekend, Thursday through Sunday. Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, playing host to the RBC Heritage. Now into your Reliant Bank headlines of the day for hour number one. Tickets for the upcoming Sanford International presented by First Premier Bank will go on sale this Friday and can be purchased at SanfordInternational.com. PGA Tour Champions event takes place in mid-September, the 9th through the 15th at Minnehaha Country Club right here in Sioux Falls. There are a number of ticket options available, including Premier Club badges, daily grounds passes, weekend grounds passes, and packages that also include food and merch many with limited time special pricing more info everything goes on sale friday at sanfordinternational.com augustana softball set to host wayne state today at Bowden field the vikings holding first place in the nsic are currently riding a 16 game win streak while holding an unblemished record at home this year Game one slated for 4 p.m. Game two should be the first ever game under the lights. Beginning at 6 o'clock, Wayne State comes in 7-33 and on the year, 3-13 and in conference. Just about the opposite. Augustana has swept eight straight series. They're 34-13, and 19-1 and in the conference. Dynamic team. We heard from Coach Melstead on yesterday's program. A lot of fun to follow along with Augustana softball so far this season. South Dakota State baseball opens the week with the four games against teams from the Twin Cities with a Wednesday night matchup at Minnesota. First pitch is set for 6 o'clock from Cybert Field in Minneapolis. Video coverage will be available through the Big Ten Plus streaming platform. Jackrabbit Baseball 15-18 and 18 overall after dropping the last two games of a three-game Summit League weekend series at Omaha. Of South Dakota State's 33 games so far this season, 32 have been played outside of the state of South Dakota at a road or neutral site. Minnesota is 14 and 16. Should be a fun matchup midweek series. And by the way, today's game against the Gophers will mark the 55, 55th time that SDSU and the Golden Gophers have met on the baseball diamond. Minnesota leads the all time series that dates back to 1947 by a count of 39 to 15. 24th rated Augustana baseball team prepares for three midweek games over the course of two days. The Vikings will travel to play Wayne State for an NSIC doubleheader starting at 1.30 this afternoon before playing a single nine-inning game against Dakota Wesleyan at 3 p.m. on Thursday at Ronkin Field. Complete action, of course, can be followed. GoAuggie.com slash live. Vikings are 45-53-1 against Wayne State and 29-5 against Dakota Wesleyan all-time in their history. History. The L.A. Lakers prize for beating the New Orleans Pelicans 110-106 to in the play-in to secure the number 7 seed in the first round of the playoffs is a matchup with defending NBA champion Denver. L.A. won 12 of its last 15 games to make it happen, sealing its fate in a rematch against last year's Western Conference Finals opponent that swept the Lakers out of the playoffs, and Denver has won 8 straight overall against the Lakers. A loss Tuesday in New Orleans would have set up a do-or-die game on Friday for the Lakers, hosting the Kings. A lot of people said, hey, rest your starters. Take it easy. We'll see what uh, happens there. Darvin Ham pushes back, though, saying there was a report of what? As he referenced that chatter, insane asylum sources say, 
While Ham was adamant in his rejection of a planned loss, Lakers star LeBron James was just as effusive in the respect he showed for the Nuggets. It's the defending champion, James said. They know what it takes. They know how to win. They've gotten extremely dominant on their home floor over the last few years. They've got an MVP on their team as he lauds the Denver Nuggets ahead of the matchup. You got to beat the best to be the best, as they say. The Lakers will need to do just that in a first-round matchup that begins out in Denver on Saturday. As Golden State Warriors guard Clay Thompson headed to the bench with just two minutes to go in their play-in loss to the Kings, his head hung low last night, according to ESPN.com. He made a, ra- a round of hugs with team trainers and teammates before he took his seat. After the final buzzer sounded, he took a moment before exiting the floor to look back at the Kings lighting the beam. It was on, uh, possibly Thompson's last game with the Warriors and the 118-94 loss to Sacramento sent Golden State into its earliest offseason in three years. And it sent Thompson into unrestricted free agency. Warriors coach Steve Kerr said after the game, we need Clay back. He's still got a lot of good years left, and I know I speak for everyone in the organization. We want him back. It could be the end of the big three there, Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, Steph Curry, but could it be Clay back and uh, Draymond Dowd? Or what happens this offseason? Everything's up in the air right now for Golden State. The only thing that will be back for sure, Steph Curry moving forward. Those are your Reliant Bank headlines of the day. As always, for a better local banking option, check them out in person in the 605 or online at ReliantBank.com. We take the break back to talk Chiefs football. Adam Teicher, ESPN NFL Nation, Kansas City Chiefs reporter, next on Overtime. College hoops and NBA basketball, the NFL and Major League Baseball. It's all here on ESPN 102.3 and AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls Sports Leader. Right back with you. It is the Wednesday edition of Overtime right here on ESPN 102.3 AM 1000 KSOO. You guys know I love the NFL draft just about more than anyone, and I promised you we're going to be checking in with all of our area teams and the one to our south that has won back-to-back Super Bowls. Pretty darn important, the Kansas City Chiefs. We're joined now by ESPN NFL Nation Kansas City Chiefs reporter Adam Teicher, one of our favorites on the ESPN hotline. Adam, very busy time, very exciting time of year. How you getting along these days? Good, Bert. Uh, how are you guys doing? Hey, we're doing great. We're clear of the snow. People are starting to swing the golf clubs around here. We're doing pretty good. Okay. Not the greatest, uh, most prettiest last couple of days, but we're getting there. Hope things are great down your way. We've made it just about to draft week. Of course, that's next week. We're just over a week away. How you feeling? And uh, what is your overall? I asked Rob Domofsky this earlier in the week, so I got to ask you, you have the opportunity and the challenge of predicting the Chiefs pick every year for ESPN NFL Nation. What is your track record like? Are you ever close? Or are you ever spot on with those picks? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I nailed it with Mahomes, believe it or not, wow. um, a few years ago. Yeah, I, I did, and uh, I'm sure you yeah, nailed it. Back- I'm sure you nailed it, thinking he would be one of the greatest of all time, too, right? Uh, no, um, <laughs> but I did, I did know that they liked him. So I, I did nail that one. But other than that, uh, my record has not been great. Of course, they've traded a few first round picks. So I haven't had a first round pick and I'll defend myself saying, Hey, they're picking at the end of the round oh, yeah. every year. Right. Oh, so, yeah. uh, a little bit more difficult there, but, um, so, and, and I'm not really, um, I, I don't have my pick yet. I, I don't have to make it until, um, Friday. So, uh, um, I, I don't know what I'm going to do yet with, for the Chiefs, but um, um, so maybe you can help me out here with my thinking. But uh, I, I'm not settled on a guy for this year yet. All right, let me page through here because I've been working through these picks and through these uh, predictions back to 32, where the Chiefs pick. I have uh, wide receiver help up there, tackles, anybody that falls, cornerback uh, Nate Wiggins, Cooper DeGene, Kool-Aid McKinstry. So those are just a few names that might maybe fit for Kansas City. That's your little courtesy from your boy here in Sioux Falls. When it comes to uh, the Chiefs offseason, highs and lows, obviously tough situation right now with Rasheed Rice they're dealing with. They said so long to LeJarrius Sneed. They said welcome back to Chris Jones. How do you rate this Chiefs offseason? It's been a wild one. Yeah, it has. Um, you know, they concentrated, as we know, mainly on keeping their own and got Chris Jones done, but uh, LeJarrius Sneed got away, and uh, at least they got a draft pick for him. Um, you know, it, it, Hollywood Brown has been their big uh, uh, free agent addition so far, and we'll see uh, you know, whether he can be the, the number one guy that they've kind of missed the last couple of years. So, uh 
going to be interesting to see uh, how it unfolds, but uh, it's, it's a little bit of run it back, at least uh, defensively for sure. When you talk about the Chiefs and you talk about dynasties and teams that are at the top, everyone always wants to know how much longer is this guy going to play? How much longer is this going to stay together? We're seeing that debate today with the Golden State Warriors and the NBA. When it comes to Kelsey and Jones and Mahomes, obviously Mahomes still young. Jones still relatively young. But Kelsey, every year, feels like, when is this dude going to slow down? Do you see that happening anytime soon? And what do you make of his kind of overall demeanor and, and personality at this stage of his career? Yeah, well, he's um, going to be 35 years old in uh, October, so um, you, you have to take it seriously. And, and the thing you got to remember is guys don't generally, guys don't lose it um, slowly over time. You know, it, it just sort of hits. It just It's almost an overnight thing where a guy turns from a productive player into a kind of a guy who's uh, on the real downhill slide of his career. So you really have to watch that with Kelsey, uh, you know, we've seen no uh, sign of that so far, but that doesn't mean it won't happen this year, you know, so uh, it, it is an issue for the Chiefs, and uh, um, it, it's kind of interesting to see what they're eventually going to do about replacing him, you know, do they, you know, start thinking about that now and, and, and draft somebody who's going to, uh, you know, groom him to take Kelsey's place, and in the meantime, use a lot of two tight end stuff and get benefits out of both of them. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what they uh, what they have to, to to say about that and how they handle that. Adam Teicher, ESPN NFL Nation, Kansas City Chiefs reporter, our guest here, Wednesday edition of Overtime. You talk about uh, Kelsey, you talk about Jones and Mahomes. That's really the core of the team. But you got all sorts of guys that uh, have re-signed or are still under contract with the team that make this team go. And a couple of those guys that are back, Mike Dana and Drew Tranquil, how important were those re-signings for Kansas City this offseason? Yeah, I think um, very important. Um, you know, Mike Dana is kind of a, you know, he, he, plays mostly on the edge but he can play inside and does play inside so she's move him around a lot and he you know he can handle a lot of different roles and uh you know the chiefs will definitely find um a, a lot of uh, you know good use out of him he'll he'll get a lot of playing time no matter what they do with him you know drew tranquil was a real find last year for them i mean they they knew him well after from playing against him when he was with the chargers and really liked him but um you know in terms of how productive he really was I, I don't even think the Chiefs expected that so uh, you know they they were comfortable letting Willie Gay leave as a free agent because they um, wanted to sign uh, uh, Drew Tranquil they thought that uh, you know that that was a, a win for them so uh, um, you know I think both those guys are going to be key uh, people for the Chiefs key players going forward here. Adam, let's talk a little bit about free agency because we're past the first wave. We're past the second wave, really. And you get these values of the veterans, one-year deals, short-term deals, whatever it might be, uh, post-draft, maybe even pre-draft. Do you see Kansas City having any needs that they're still going to dip their toe into free agency for at this stage? Yeah, I mean, we know they're nowhere close at um, a wide receiver to having yeah. a full group. Yep. Or, you know, we, we know that. And, and so... Um, you know, maybe they're going to wait to see how this develops during the draft, but I, I could definitely see them bringing in a veteran wide receiver. And some of that maybe depends on how the Rasheed Rice situation plays out. But I, I think that's a real position to watch as wide receiver. And, you know, maybe it's not somebody who's currently on the market, but somebody who gets cut by another team. So um, it, it, that, that's a situation that definitely bears watching. You know, left tackle is another one where Donovan Smith, they did that with him. They signed him right after the draft last year. And, um, you know, could they bring in another guy like that this year? That's certainly possible. You know, those are the positions that I think we, uh, most people or I at least would expect them to uh, bring some people in if they do that. So, yeah, I don't think free agency necessarily is uh, done yet for the Chiefs. And, and maybe for a lot of teams as well, there, there could be some good bargains out there coming up um, now when guys maybe feel some pressure before a draft to sign and, and certainly after a draft, uh, maybe somebody gets cut. So uh, there'll be some uh, pretty good players out there who can probably be had at a reasonable cost. 
And obviously a lot to keep an eye on as we lean into NFL Draft Week next week, post-draft, and then, of course, around training camp time, even leading into the preseason. A lot of veterans uh, fall that far and that late into that free agency cycle. Lastly, Adam, before we let you go, we talked about some fits. We talked about the needs when it comes to predicting and and trying to kind of put a box around just a few guys that might fit at the end of round number one. It's it's pretty darn tough to predict because there's 31 teams picking ahead of you. It's a pretty good place to be at the end of the football season. Pretty bad place to be at the NFL draft overall. But that's the cost of winning a title. What are what are a few fits position wise? I'm not going to ask you player wise, but position wise that make a lot of sense at the back end of round one. Round one. Do you think it's receiver? Is it just depend on value there? Yeah, I think a lot of it is going to depend on value. I mean, if you're looking at positional needs, certainly wide receiver, offensive tackle are probably one and two. And don't discount running back. I don't think the Chiefs will draft a running back in the first round, but they, uh, I, I sort of left running back out of the positions where they might add a veteran. They don't have a full depth chart there. I think they'll draft somebody maybe in a middle round, but uh, – um, it's, uh, that, you know, that's another position to keep an eye on, but not the first round, but going back to your original question, um, you know, the chiefs, a lot of times think more in terms of pl- good players instead of positions yeah. when they're drafting and they really need to do that. And, and, um, I, I think that's the best strategy. So it really wouldn't surprise me to see him go in a different direction in the first round. You know, if there's a good corner out there, if there's a good interior offensive lineman out there that they really like and think can be a a productive player for them, not only I think would they do that, I think they should do that. I mean, they they don't need to force needs, I guess is what I'm saying. So uh, um, I I think that's – I'm pretty confident that's the way they will go. Um, But having said that, I think it will be a wide receiver, um, most likely, maybe an offensive tackle. Those would be my two best um, predictions, but it it wouldn't surprise me to see them do something else. Can't wait for it. Kansas City Chiefs reporter Adam Teicher. Wish you all the best and best of luck predicting pick number 32, my friend. We'll talk to you again here soon. (laughs) Thanks, as always, for the insight, and have a great draft week, Adam. Thanks. Thanks, Bert. Good stuff. All right, ESPN NFL Nation, Kansas City Chiefs reporter Adam Teicher. Always a blast, and it's tough and fun and hard to predict the Kansas City Chiefs at the back end of round number one. But again, really bad place to be in the NFL draft. Tough to predict, not great value, but that's the cost of winning another Lombardi Trophy. Back-to-back champions for the Kansas City Chiefs. A lot to look forward to for them. But all of a sudden, with the Rasheed Rice situation, a guy who had nothing short of a fantastic, fantastic, rookie season in Kansas City. Not only did he get and have a nice stat line at the end of the year, but you saw that gradual progression from week number one all the way to the end of the year where he was a dude that was in the end zone all the time, catching and running, doing everything for that offense. And now, not only the immediate future, but the long-term career, a little bit in jeopardy for Rasheed Rice. We're not going to speculate on that any further, but could be facing discipline from the NFL, from the Chiefs or otherwise. And we'll wait and see how that impacts their roster, their depth chart, and their plans for 2024 and beyond. But it's Hollywood Brown, and that's just about it as far as big names at wide receiver goes in Kansas City as of today. They got some veteran options out there on the open market, and of course, they have a ton of options in the NFL draft. But as we know, with rookies at any position in the NFL, Pretty darn hard to get a plug-and-play, contribute-right-away kind of player, especially when you're picking towards the back end of every round. That's your Kansas City Chiefs draft preview. Talk is always great with Adam Teicher, ESPN NFL Nation Chiefs reporter. We will take the break, and when we come back, we got that, as promised, very prolonged edition of the good the bad the ugly i got an article today from espn that absolutely strung strung a chord with me hits pretty close to home we'll talk about that and a slew of other articles that are good bad and ugly from the sports world coming up next it's the wednesday edition of overtime right here on espn sioux falls and coverage. We are ESPN 102.3 and AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls Sports Leader.
right back with you. It is the early Wednesday edition of Overtime. Welcome back. This April 17th edition of the program. Ever miss any of the show? Podcast links always available at ESPNSiouxFalls.com or on the free ESPN Sioux Falls app. We got a lot to get to today in a short show, and I thought about it, and there's a lot that fits into the category of good to great today, a lot that fits into the category of bad, and a couple articles have struck a nerve with me that are plain and simply ugly today. There's a great write-up right now at ESPN.com. Can't wait to tell you all about it. Let's do it. It's time now for the prolonged edition of The Good, The Bad, The Ugly right here on Overtime. Many days there are those who can be called a problem child. You know the ones. They have a tendency to display an ugly side. They have their whiny moments. Some display an outright bad side of themselves. And then there are those who stand out in a good way. Well, here they are. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Certainly a lot to get to in the sports world today in the good, the bad, the ugly, but the Washington Capitals are moving on, and it was a good night to be a Caps fan. T.J. Oshie shot the puck into an empty net and in the process scored one of the more improbable game-winning goals in recent NHL history and sent his team, the Washington Capitals, into the Stanley Cup playoffs. Oshie's empty net goal with just three minutes to go helped the exhausted Caps beat the Flyers 2-1 to one last night under absurd circumstances. The score was tied at 1-1 to one when Philadelphia coach John Tortorella pulled his goaltender for an extra attacker because his team needed to win in regulation to keep their hopes alive. What Tortorella didn't know was that Detroit scoring 3.3 seconds to go remaining to force overtime at Montreal perhaps a minute earlier actually eliminated the Flyers. We'll take it, Captain uh, Capitals captain Alex Ovechkin said. Thanks, Philly. Tortorella found out just after Oshie's empty netter about the Red Wings' result. By then, it was too late, and the result also eliminated Detroit and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Washington will face the President's Trophy-winning New York Rangers in the first round beginning this weekend, returning to the playoffs after a one-year absence ended their eight-year streak. It means a lot, said T.J. Oshie, one of a handful of players remaining from the Capitals' 2018 Stanley Cup team, along with Ovechkin, John Carlson, and Tom Wilson. Once you win one time, the regular season just haven't doesn't have as much meaning as the playoff games, so to get back there is really going to be super special and definitely won't take it for granted. The boys are ready to rock. Welcome to the Stanley Cup playoffs. Unusual fashion, but again, you can only do so much with the info you have from Philly's perspective. Washington, the team heading to the Stanley Cup playoffs. That's good news there. Other good news, the WNBA starting to feeling the ripple effect of Caitlin Clark already. The Caitlin Clark experience delivered another TV milestone as ESPN's coverage of the WNBA draft on Monday night averaged a record 2.45 2.45 million viewers. Viewership peaked at over 3 million. ESPN said in a release on Tuesday, the audience was more than four times as many viewers when compared to last year's draft, which drew just over 570,000. Previous draft record was 601,000 in 2004 when UConn's Diana Taurasi went number one overall. And Monday's viewership was the highest for any WNBA telecast since 2000 when NBC... Average 2.74 million viewers for a Memorial Day contest between the Liberty and the now defunct Houston Comets. The reason for such a high audience on Monday was not only Caitlin Clark, but it was Caitlin Clark, a generational player from Iowa who brought thousands of new fans to the sport. Even if Clark wasn't going pro, it would have been a record breaker. But it wouldn't have been this much of a record breaker for the WNBA draft. That sport is about to blow up, just like we've seen college basketball on the women's side blow up over the last couple years. They are both here to stay and continue to gain some turf in the national sports scene. On to the bad now. Cowboys fans, you got a right to be frustrated in free agency and this offseason. So far in free agency, the largest two payouts by the Dallas Cowboys have made total Just under $6 million, they went to cornerback Jordan Lewis and linebacker former Viking Eric Kendricks. According to the NFLPA's website, the Cowboys have $7.4 million in salary cap space and have yet to fill vacancies created by the departures of left tackle Tyron Smith, center Tyler Biotish, running back Tony Pollard, and defensive end 
Dorrance Armstrong. We spend max, max money year in and year out. All 32 can only spend the same amount of money over a five-year stretch. Executive Vice President Stephen Jones told 105.3 The Fan in Dallas, when we're all said and done, we max out our salary cap every year. We will have done that, and when it comes to having a good roster, which we do, we also are looking forward to signing our own guys. It doesn't mean it happens overnight, but when you're wanting to sign players like Dak and Micah and C.D. Lamb, then certainly you have to hold money back if you want to have a realistic chance of signing those guys. I certainly understand the sentiment from Stephen Jones, but I certainly disagree when it comes to taking swings and being quote-unquote all in. Don't say that stuff if you're not going to do it. You want your fan base to believe it. And the Cowboys have been more so all in than not. Over the last three decades, it has not paid off in Super Bowl championships or Super Bowl appearances or NFC Championship game appearances. But the Cowboys certainly have tried. But this offseason, when you re-up with a head coach after many thought he should be fired after three consecutive 12-5 and five seasons and no NFC Championship game appearances, you re-up with the coach. You re-up with the quarterback, and you're looking to build around, maybe strike while the iron's hot, give these folks an opportunity to go ahead and win in the playoffs again. After all, why did you keep him on staff if you weren't planning on winning and giving him tools to succeed is beyond me. Dallas needs to go ahead and reach out and make some splashy signings. They need to have a near-perfect NFL draft to stay competitive this year in the NFC. They've got a top-level roster. They need to fill it out with some more top-tier talent. And youngsters, they have money. $7.4 million is what they've got right now in cap space. But as we know, from all the big contracts we see every year and every offseason, this guy signs a $25 million deal. This guy's two years, $24 million, whatever it is. You can massage and move around the cap to your liking and any way you want. They say pay the piper. It comes around eventually. That's fine. Dallas should be going all in right now. While they have a quarterback, while they have an elite receiver, while they have an elite defense, which they do, Dallas should be going ahead and pushing and kicking the can down the field as to signing players now, paying them two, three million this year and 10, 15, 20 million next year. And in 2026, you got to be aggressive and some might call it foolish. But everyone wins that way in the National Football League, barring some crazy rookie quarterback contract. You've got these guys that are playing on mega deals and guys that are going to be paid buku bucks down the line, but it's all worth it if you win in January and if you win in February and hoist up the Lombardi Trophy, you got to be aggressive, and Dallas is shying away from that this offseason, and it's driving their fans very much understandably absolutely bonkers. Other bad news, bad news, changing of the guard for the Duke Blue Devil basketball program. Duke senior guard Jeremy Roach has planned to enter the transfer portal and the NBA draft. His announcement made yesterday. Roach made the announcement post on Instagram, started 106 games in four years with the Blue Devils, earning third team All-ACC as a senior and honorable mention All-ACC as a junior. Roach, Roach, excuse me, enjoyed a true breakout season his junior year, and he is now the fifth Duke player this offseason to enter the portal. Following Christian Reeves, Mark Mitchell, Jalen Blakes, and Jaden Shutt, the Blue Devils also lost Kyle Filipowski and Jared McCain to the NBA draft, while Ryan Young is out of eligibility. That's a lot of basketball players. That's his eight basketball players that were on the roster last year that presumably Will not be on the roster next year. The good news, though, for you Duke fans, they can always reload. It's a great brand down there in Durham. John Shire bringing in the nation's top-ranked recruiting class, led by number one prospect Cooper Flagg and top 10 recruit Isaiah Evans. But Duke, as a program and the players out there contributing, will look entirely different coming up this season. Now on to the ugly by almost any definition. New York Knicks guard Dante DiVincenzo was among the NBA's most improved players this season. Shooting efficiency metrics reached career uh, career best levels, up 9.4 points per game from a season ago to 15.5 this year, drained a franchise record 283 threes this year. Beyond all that, he suited up and played in 81 of 82 games for demanding Knicks coach Tom Thibodeau, logging a career-high 2,360 minutes in the process, but get a load of this. DiVincenzo still won't end up factoring into the most improved player award voting. It turns out he's ineligible due to a caveat in the league's rules. An NBA spokesperson confirmed the news yesterday. 
It's been well established since last offseason that candidates for major league-wide awards have to appear in a minimum of 65 games to be eligible. Don't have a problem with that. However, for a game to count toward that total, players have to log at least 20 minutes of playing time. Don't understand that. DiVincenzo finished the regular season with 62 game appearances of more than 20 minutes. The league allows for a tiny bit of leeway, giving players credit for up to two or more 20-minute showings if they log between 15 or 20 minutes of playing time. Even then, though, DiVincenzo only gets up to 64 qualifying appearances. He had 66 games in which he logged 19 and a half minutes or more, including four appearances that fell less than 30 seconds short of that 20-minute total. But the NBA doesn't round up official minute total. So Dante DiVincenzo, one of the players that should be A shoe-in for the most improved player award this season. Big-time contributor, big-time player out with the New York Knicks. Is not eligible for the trophy that more than likely he should be a favorite or the second favorite to win this year. I understand the threshold for MVP. I understand the threshold for offensive, defensive player of the year, whatever award you want to chalk it up to. But for sixth man of the year, for most improved player, somebody that's working their way back from an injury, working their way back into a rotation, working their way back onto the floor at all. This makes no sense to me. Shame on the NBA. They need to include Dante Givincenzo in this most improved player award. I don't like the fact that they have all these rules and stipulations for awards like that. I certainly understand for MVP and for the big name awards, but for awards like most improved player, comeback player, six man, whatever it might be, I don't understand the restraint there at all as we move forward into the NBA playoffs. Now, lastly, here's the article I was talking about off the jump today. Hits close to home. My brother attended the Air Force Academy, was not a football athlete, was not a basketball athlete, but nonetheless attended the academy. So it hits close to home for me when we talk about guys that want to make the jump to the NBA, want to make the jump to the NFL, or in their sport of choice. On March 13th, scouts from 18 NFL teams traveled to Colorado Springs to the Air Force Academy Pro Day. The event has never been a high-priority stop for talent evaluators ahead of the draft, but this time there was an elevated sense of importance. Part of that was obvious over the past three seasons. Air Force, that's right, Air Force, has the ninth best winning percentage in all of college football at the big boy level and the second best mark among group of five teams. And scouts were eager to see the talented players who made up such a winning program. Another part was almost ceremonial, though. The academies will likely still hold pro days next year, but they won't function the same way given none of the graduating seniors will be eligible to play right away. As things sit right now, this will be the last year that the United States government will permit service academy players, those at Army, Navy, and Air Force, to jump directly from college to pro sports next year athletes will be required to serve two years in the military as has been long established since 2019 before having the option to pursue professional sports while complete completing the rest of their service commitment in the reserves two years being away from the game is a tremendous setback said jet gladchuk who has served as navy's athletic director since 2001 we don't guarantee anyone that they're going to make the pros or that they're going to get a tryout. But if you've got a young man coming up the ranks here and develops and realizes I'm good enough, why shouldn't he get to take that shot? The ever-changing policy has been the subject of debate over the past several years, especially since December of 2022, when a passage in the National Defense Authorization Act stated that a, quote, cadet may not obtain employment, including as a professional athlete, until after completing the cadet's commission service program, service obligation. And now Andre Carter II, Army linebacker from last year, signed as an undrafted free agent with Minnesota. He is playing under this exemption that is going to expire after this year. And there's several draftable guys from Air Force, including Bo Richter, pass rusher. You got a safety, Trey Taylor from Air Force that's also draft eligible, and a slew of other guys. But I have never understood this about service academies, Army, Navy, Air Force. I understand and I get the sacrifice I love the Commander-in-Chief's trophy, watching those teams play and being a part of that each and every year. And as you look at that, an athlete, a guy that goes to these service academies, obviously knows what he or she is signing up for. I understand that. 
You sign up for the commitment. You're going there getting a top-tier education. You're going to be a commissioned officer in those respective branches, Army, Air Force, and Navy. I understand the commitment part, and I appreciate the service so much of everyone in our military. But to rob somebody that is good enough to go and play in the NFL, good enough to play in the NBA, the WNBA, pro softball, pro volleyball, whatever it might be, whatever your choice, a sport of choice is, to rob them the opportunity in their prime where they're good enough to get that call, good enough to go and experience that, even though they're going to make up their service on the back end regardless. They know their commitment. The people that go to the service academies are aware wholeheartedly of what they're signing up for. And the worst part about all this is they're not trying to get out of a thing. And as noted later in that article, available at ESPN.com, I would read it if I were you. It's fantastic. As noted in that article, no one's trying to get out of service. All they're trying to do is they end the article. They're not trying to get out of their service. I think the most important thing to understand is these kids come here. They choose to serve. They want to serve. But that window for them is so small, so to require a two-year delay just makes no sense. It doesn't make sense. We saw good players to great players in the NFL serve in the past. Roger Staubach, one of the best quarterbacks of all time, went and fought in a war, served as well, and Staubach went on to a great NFL career. There's other big guys across the league. Mike Wall, who joins the show from time to time, was one of those guys, as was Alejandro Villanueva of Army, who had a pretty good NFL career. But to take two years out of these guys and gals that are looking to make the leap into pro sports just to fulfill a service obligation right away just is not right for what they go there for. They understand the commitment. They understand the service. But you go to Air Force and you go play football, you go play basketball, whatever it might be, and you're good enough. Why aren't we giving these kids the opportunity to go ahead and chase that dream and then say, hey, come on back when you're finished. Thanks for your service. We'll get you on the back end of your career. Best of luck. And now this sends such a bad message moving forward to the service academies and those people that are being recruited by the service academies because if you're a guy that grew up in Chicago, a guy that grew up in Colorado Springs or elsewhere, whatever, if you're good enough and you're getting recruited by Air Force, Army, and Navy, man, what an honor that is. But, hey, you can't go pro. We love you, but you can't go pro. You can go to Toledo instead. You can go to Kent State instead. You can go to Colorado State instead, and you'll get to play, and you can go pro right away. Seems like an easy decision based on priorities, but again, it's all up in the air. But I would urge everyone to read that article and think a little bit more about that. And I really hope that we can get some sensical approach to that in the future because it doesn't make sense for those kids that are good enough and great enough athletes at their sport to have to serve their two-year obligation right away. And by the time that they get out, maybe they're out of shape. Maybe they've lost the love for the game. Maybe they've been overlooked. Maybe people are concerned about their overall stamina and their athleticism moving forward. They've been out of the game for two years. They're serving the military, which is awesome. Great opportunity and an honor. But it doesn't make sense right now for them to have to serve it right away based on deferring it until the conclusion of their pro shot. End of speech. That's the good, the bad, the ugly. That is our number one. Back with your headlines and highlights coming up next on Overtime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.